Hello everyone, my name is Lyndon Smith and I'm Professor in Computer Simulation and Machine Vision at UWE. So I've got a presentation here which uh, explains a few things about where I'm coming from and what I've been doing at UWE over the years. So I thought I'd start to get the beginning. Uh, as I say, I'm Professor of Computer Simulation and Machine Vision and we're in the Centre for Machine Vision at UWE. So we do a lot of vision work, machine vision work, and principally we're kind of um, dealing with three-dimensional machine vision, so we're getting range data, and we're also using a lot of AI or deep learning. So there's the kind of two niches we've got. And uh, we've applied our systems to all sorts of sectors and developed systems that we use all around the world to give new types of functionality for people who need it, really. So my activities then are directed towards leadership of the Centre for Machine Vision. I'm the Deputy Director. Um, and we're in the BRL, which of course is in EDM, in FET at UWE. And what we're trying to do all the time is doing more and more research with good impact. Because the more impact you get, the higher the profile the research is and the more funding the university will get for research in the future. But also, of course, I do some teaching which is lecturing on machine vision courses and, of course, supervising PhDs. Now, why did I get into engineering at all, you might ask? Well, um, I guess it was fitting in with what the family were doing. Um, my father was an engineer, as was his father, as his father. My brother Mel, of course, is an engineer. And my father had um, a Morris Minor Traveller, which he bought in 1970 and there you can see it's uh, smoke grey in fact and uh, I just thought it was a fascinating car I mean when he got that car I was really really fascinated by it and um, even now I think it's a pretty amazingly fascinating car to be honest but uh, I was always interested in machines and engineering aspects I guess and I guess that's why I got into the into the career angle of it really And uh, of course, I was always interested in making these models and airfix kits. And I remember I had quite a large one on the, uh, the old Supermarine Spitfire. And it wasn't just that either. Lancaster, Harrier, the Vigilante was the first one I did, I think. Dornier, the MGB GT, of course, my uncle had one of those. Uh, Mercedes 350SL, the Nissan Bluebird, it was cars as well. Steam traction engine, that was really elaborate and uh, took a long time to build that one. And then ships like the Hood, and I think maybe there was a riverboat, an American riverboat at one time. DC-10 aircraft, yeah, Boeing Super Fortress B-29, remember that one. And lots of others actually, which I can't you know, remember right now, but there were many, many of these things. So I used to have a bit of a passion for that, kind of interested in how that fitted together. So I guess that's again, that's an engineering related uh, activity. And then of course, at school, I got into physics. Then, uh, Isaac Newton, of course, being a great inspiration, I think, to everybody who has some kind of interest in physics, uh, with the whole of mechanics, really, being based on his three simple laws. And, uh, you know, it always amazed me, really, that all the machines we have are based on mechanics. I mean, the, the moonshot, getting a man on the moon, that was using Newton's laws, of course. And, I mean, the rocket itself works according to his law of action and reaction, his third law, doesn't it, for example. So Isaac Newton's always a, a fascinating character. And actually, I wasn't too bad at physics. I managed to get on with it pretty well at school. I, they even gave me a couple of prizes. So when I got them, I, I asked for these books. And Carl, I still got the books now, of course. Carl Sagan, where he talks all about uh, the history of science and uh, future possibilities. And then Arthur C. Clarke was my favourite science fiction author. So books like Childhood's End uh, are still a bit fascinated by now, to be honest. And uh, the kind of things that that future... I mean, Arthur Clarke, he predicted quite accurately the internet in 1964 and uh, was talking about doing operations remotely, which is just people are just talking about doing now on the internet. So he was well ahead of his time, uh, a bit of a futurist. He was also interested in things like um, uh, space elevators and mass accelerators. He came up with the idea of the mass accelerator. So uh, really interesting futuristic things to do with space, I guess. And then after uh, I got into it at school, of course, went on to university and did a degree in physics, which was okay, and then uh, followed up with an MSc in robotics. And that's me and Mel with a robot that we built. Uh, it was actually a, 
um, materials handling robot. There's a lot of work building it, running up and down a track there, as you can see. And uh, but I hadn't really forgotten about, um, well, when we were doing, as it says there, when we were doing the computer, the robotics degree, there was um, quite a lot of involvement of computer vision. And I guess that was when I first got into computer vision and I've been looking at it since then. But uh, I hadn't really given up with engineering either because the master's project I did at Cranfield in this master's degree was actually on Taguchi methods applied to components that a local manufacturing company were making in the Cotswolds. So that was all coming back to engineering again. And then uh, having done that MSc, to cut a long story short, I started on a PhD in 1993, I think it was. It ran through to 97 was the... Was the uh, graduation on that one and then at that uh, you know my supervisor was Dr. Sago Mida who I'm still in contact with great guy and he said to me though I always remember he said to me when when on the, one of the first meetings we had on the PhD I want you to generate 10 papers from this PhD and I was sort of staggered around a bit I think I think he eventually managed it but um, it was probably a good idea for him to motivate me by saying that kind of stuff because you need a challenge I think um, to get on with it, to get on with these kind of things and those papers informed this book, which um, I published uh, with the, the Engineering Research Series, um, A Knowledge-Based System for Powder Metallurgy Technology, which is available on Amazon at the moment. Uh, that, for example, has been around for a while. And Sago, I'm still in contact with him. He's still helping people in, uh, in Britain and India and uh, doing a great, great job. So uh, that was where, that's where I continued with the PhD, which was always a fascinating thing for me to do. And that's where I got into computer simulation, because a lot of the work in the PhD was computer simulation, simulation of the irregular powder particles that you use to make components in powder metallurgy, for example. And also, of course, um, machine vision to, for looking at the powders and looking at the components and so on. So it was the things I'm interested in were, were covered in the PhD somewhat. And then the PhD landed actually, led to a secondment in America. It was at the PM lab at uh, Penn State, right in the middle of uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, Rand German invited me over, and uh, he was, I think, he was the world's leading expert in powder metallurgy because um, he really had a, a, a tremendous laboratory there powder injection molding, compaction, furnacing, sintering. And uh, it was a great experience to, to see all sorts of research, world class research going on. And I'm still in contact with him. He's, um, he's now moved to San Diego University. And uh, so again, been into cars and engineering. I, I did buy a Ford Thunderbird um, over there and, and uh, also met my wife over there. And uh, we drove it all around the northwest United States. And uh, that was a 10th generation Thunderbird, actually, that one. That's it. That's a picture I took of it at Stone Valley Lake, which is where we used to like going, which is really in the center of uh, Pennsylvania. So that's kind of, unfortunately, I had to sell it when coming back, but uh, I was quite keen on that car. Now, getting back to the UK, you know, rejoining UW in 2000, Mel and I set up the UW Machine Vision Lab, used to be over in the DuPont building in those days. And uh, we got funding for a set of projects from a company in the US called Quantronics. And, um, you know, this was the idea of this was that, I don't know if you know, but under the seating on aircraft, there's a lot of space where they put air freight. And they want to know how big it is because space is more important nowadays than weight a lot of the time because there's a lot of high tech stuff being communicated, tra you know, being transported. So th this was a system we measured. As you can see there, it's hanging from the ceiling. We had some laser scanning going on. It was measuring the size of the objects on the pallets. It worked pretty well. Even in quite bright light, it would work pretty well. And uh, we installed it in their factory in Salt Lake City. And uh, yeah, it was quite. we went over a few times to, to help them with it and install it. And they sold it actually. They sold it, ironically, back to the UK, back to the MOD. And uh, they sold, last time I spoke to them, they sold over a million pounds worth of it. And uh, it's, part, it's called the Cubiscan 1000. And uh, it's part of their, there's a metrology company that make uh, machines for measuring. And uh, it's part of their sales lineup, really. So that was the first thing. That enabled us to get the funding to set up the Machine Vision Lab, which we're still running today, but now it's called the Centre for Machine Vision. And since that time, of course, we expanded the Centre for Machine Vision. So now we've got over 20 members and um, got 20 successful PhDs have come out of it at the centre. And of course, we published some hundreds of papers and uh, delivered new types of 3D vision systems to customers 
in all sorts of sectors, agri-tech, uh, you know, measurement of aggregate, um, security, medicine, all sorts of sectors across the globe. And there's a couple here. This was one that we got from, this one here is showing an NIHR grant that we got, which was for non-contact breathing measurement. So it's a bit like in Star Trek where you've got that, um, those readings coming out above the, above the couch. Um, there's no contact, but you can still measure your breath using a 3D vision system. So we proved it worked. You can see here it's measuring the breathing. But um, it needs further development to actually make it commercially viable in the ward. And this system we built for the London Underground, and um, it's now operational in a laboratory in central London, in Farringdon. And you can see here that we're getting three-dimensional face data. And the idea is a, a more reliable three-dimensional face recognition system that you could use at airports and also on, on the underground. So you don't have to mess around with paper tickets. You just go through, like, like so you go into a supermarket and, um, and it recognizes you and checks you're there and, and deals with it all with you. Obviously, that would help with throughput in the rush hour because you don't have to mess around in queues with, with those gates that they've got to, um, at the moment. But um, a lot of the time, the, although these technologies work, it's about when the company is ready to commercialize them because the gates that they're using at the moment are, are quite a good business model and um, things will move forward, but it depends on when they offer a lot of the time when the commercial partner wants to move forward, really. So next question, one question I was asked then was what inspires or excites me about research? Now, I think one thing in the kind of research we do that's quite interesting is that um, we don't buy tremendously expensive equipment. We just take items off the shelf, relatively inexpensive components, and combine them in innovative ways. And then um, the data that we get from that, we then analyze using deep learning, generally speaking. We find that's a pretty powerful way of going I mean, we can solve problems that are non-trivial and have been considered up to now intractable. Uh, and I mean by that situations where you might be outside, for example, or you're in situations where there's a lot of variation in the environment going on. Years ago, that was very difficult for computer vision systems to deal with that. But now with deep learning, even with a lot of variations like the sun going in and out, you're changing the angle you're viewing at and all that kind of thing, you can still get reliable system operation, which makes it very powerful, of course. And uh, one of the most exciting projects for me is the idea is a skin analyzer, which we've been working on for about 19 years. So here we're trying to have an easy to use, low cost and reliable means to measure patient moles to identify suspicious ones, making referrals to skin cancer specialists more reliable. So we don't flood the clinic with loads of people there's nothing wrong with. So there's less chance of masking someone who does have a problem. And of course, we save money as well. And of course, improving early detection of skin cancer could save lives. So I think that's really exciting. And uh, we've got two aspects to it. The 2D at the top there, easy and repeatable automatic measurement of what they call the ABCD values. And uh, we can detect change, which is an important um, indicator and difficult at the moment to detect. And then 3D, the, our device is the only one that can recover textures and 3D moles. And... Uh, we find that there are patterns in the 3D texture which can also be indicate suspicious moles. That's kind of interesting as well. So this is a kind of very interesting project, that, uh, but it's a bit difficult to take forward because anything in the medical field requires a lot of investment really to get take forward. And uh, we can analyze da uh, data from a benign mole for analysis of 2D and 3D characters. That's the Mark III device there. There's a Mark II on the left and then we've got a typical mold capture. And what we can do is we get the albedo, which is like the color information, the 3D information, and then we can create a rendering. We can move light around, move the view around, like shown at the top there, as though we're with the patient. So that could really be helpful for teledermatology. Um, so what we're finding then is that 3D data and AI is a really powerful combination. And uh, 3D data gives us more complete information, which we can then use for scene understanding and object segmentation. In other words, we can identify things in the foreground that are of interest and get rid of stuff in the background, which is further away, which is not of interest. But then we, when we combine the 3D data with AI and then using neural networks, especially convolutional neural networks or deep learning, we get levels of scene understanding, uh, for example, face recognition, which are comparable to what can, humans can achieve. Now, what that does is that enables robots and computers to undertake many complicated tasks 
and non-trivial tasks in the real world, which up to now have been rather difficult to implement. One example of that is detecting weeds in grass. Now, detecting weeds in dirt would be pretty easy. It's a different colour, green against the brown dirt. But this is more complicated. But we developed a system for a farm company up in Scotland using low-cost cameras, advanced image recognition, and commercial spraying. So the system goes along behind a tractor or is on a tractor. The camera sees a weed. The deep learning identifies it as a weed in the presence of grass. And then we shoot a bit of weed killer at it. And that will save between half and 95% of herbicide, which is good for the environment, saving on that, and of course saves money as well. So this is going to be something that's definitely going to hear more about in the future. And it's an example of something that's, because it's quite difficult to identify a small bit of weed, even for humans, in a, in a field, in an image of grass. But it's the sort of thing the computer can do and can provide real environmental and cost benefits. Now, a lot of these activities that I've done over the years, experiences I've had in research and academia, have informed this book, which I wrote recently. And uh, so it discusses science and technology with an emphasis on what help might be holding science and technology back and what possible remedies we might have for doing something about it to ultimately accelerate things forward. But when I'm writing this, I tried to keep it lighthearted and hopefully entertaining. So um, that was my main aim with this book. But it's out now, it's available on Amazon. So what about the future then? Well, how I see machine vision in the next five years? Well, much larger amounts of 2D and particularly 3D data need to be captured routinely and continuously to, in relation to many real world tasks. And now one thing I thought of when writing that was um, that Tesla have cameras on their cars and they're constantly recording images and sending it back to their headquarters to help them with the self-driving. So that's one example, but we can have much more of that in all sorts of fields, and especially with 3D. And then when we get all that data, if we use new types of AI to analyze and model it, then we can really have a powerful means for automated systems to sense and interpret environments, and therefore to allow them to act appropriately. In other words, robots undertaking tasks. I mean, a simple example, just spraying the weed killer on the, on the weed was one example, but it could get more complicated and more involved. You could have robots interacting in an agile way in real environments, doing various prob, uh, tasks, maybe even interacting with humans if you can get this working well enough, which would then, I think, open up a vast array of applications um, for machine vision and robotics. And what I, what I think I'd really like to see looking perhaps a little bit beyond the five years is to allow this kind of enabling technology of understanding scenes and uh, tasks to help with automated solutions to laborious tasks in various sectors. So maybe mining, farming, manufacturing and so on. So dangerous, dirty jobs, difficult jobs, start automating them. And I think that's really an exciting prospect. So that's a whirlwind sort of tour of where I'm coming from and where I've come from and the kind of things we're doing in the, in the Centre for Machine Vision at UWE. If you've got any questions, you can always email me. That's my email address or just um, uh, we'll have a chat when you see me around. But thanks very much for listening to this presentation and I hope you found it interesting.